one of the things about being in Spartanburg, one of the ways that, that my shoes have been saved, so to speak, is came from the people in this very building with, with Hub City, Hub Culture, and Hub Bub. I was brought into this community to be one of the residents. So I'm eternally grateful for that, that opportunity that was given to me. And they continue to uh, provide me with some very cool pairs of shoes and at times when I wasn't ready for that. So absolutely, absolutely. Um, some, we have somebody that's about to come and talk to us about, about Hub Culture. Um, right now, she is the Johnson Professor of History at Converse College and a community volunteer. Ladies and gentlemen, please help me welcome to the stage, Melissa Walker. The anthropologist Margaret Mead has been quoted many times but this is such a great saying that I'm going to use it again. Never doubt that a group of, a small group of thoughtful, committed citizens can change the world. Indeed, it is the only thing that ever has. And I want to tell you today about a group of poets and professors, artists and accountants, medical professionals and musicians, and lots of other people who changed the world, or at least they changed our little corner of it just a little bit. It all started with the Hub City Writers Project. Now, I first learned about the Hub City Writers Project in 1996, when I got a copy of the Spartanburg Herald Journal in my mailbox in Providence, Rhode Island. Now you're wondering how that happened. Well, my husband and I were moving to Spartanburg where I had taken a job teaching history at Converse College. And that was before the heyday of the internet. So if you wanted to learn about a new place, you didn't go online, you subscribed to the local newspaper. So we subscribed to the newspaper, got it about a week late, and I read about this cool organization called the Hub City Writers Project. Now, I should preface this by saying, when I came to Spartanburg for my interview, this marathon 24 hours spent meeting everybody at Converse, and I got one short drive-by tour after dark of downtown, and I was not impressed at all. I was really impressed with Converse, but I wasn't sure that the two of us coming from a northeastern urban area, even though I was a native southerner, I wasn't sure that we were going to be able to build a life in this little town. Uh, downtown was, whoops, I went too fast. Downtown was full of empty, boarded up buildings. It was pretty desolate when I was driven by late at night. There just didn't seem to be a lot going on here. There were six colleges, but it didn't feel like a college town. The only ethnic food you could get was Chinese or Mexican, um, which at that time was the limit of our offerings. Um, there just didn't seem to be a whole lot of the things that would, draw, that, that would attract young professionals. Once upon a time, this had been a thriving textile and trade town, though, and clearly it was in the throes of a long decline. But we moved here. History teaching jobs were and still are hard to come by. And one of the things that we read about was this Hub City Writers Project. They were going to publish an anthology of work by local authors. And they had formed sort of serendipitously when a group of writers who got together every morning at a local sandwich and coffee shop started talking about the need for revitalization in this community. They had all grown up here, and they all wanted to see this community thrive. So journalists Betsy Teeter and Gary Henderson and the poet John Lane got together at the Sandwich Factory, and according to the story, they drew up a plan on the back of a napkin to form some kind of a writer's cooperative that was a lot like the old uh, Great Depression-era Federal Writers Project. They would collect stories and essays and poems and art from the local community, and they would raise the money to publish this anthology, that anthology. And they did. I read about it. It came out in the spring of 1996, and when we moved here, one of the things I insisted we do was go to the old pick-a-book book, book bookstore and get a copy. 
copy of the Hub City Anthology. And reading that book, we started to get to know a lot of our neighbors, even before we moved here, with the stories they told about Spartanburg, which they clearly thought was still a special place, in spite of the boarded up buildings downtown. <laughs> Hub City realized that they had touched a wellspring in Spartanburg, and they kept going after this first book. They had intended one book, but they organized a festival, and then they started hosting readings, and then they published another book, and then another one, and pretty soon they had a staff, and they were doing regular things to promote the literary arts in Spartanburg. And Chuck and I went to a lot of these events, and we got to know people in town. And we found out there were a lot of people in this community who were committed to making this was a better place to live. There were people who were investing thousands of hours and thousands of dollars in improving our community. We met so many of these people at the Hub City events, and I was thrilled in 2004 Here's one of the Hub City events. I was thrilled in 2004 to be asked to join the Hub City Writers Project board. And that was a really momentous year for the Hub City Writers Project because that was the year that the city came to us and they said, you know, we need to make this the kind of place where hip young people will want to live. We need to attract our young people to come back here after college or to stay here after college. And so we think you're the organization in town that can do this. And we got together with a lot of community volunteers and we ended up hiring another staffer or two and uh, came up with this idea for hubbub.com. Hubbub.com started out as a website that was supposed to generate buzz about cool things happening in town. Um, and we also had some open mic nights, and we called them soapbox sessions at the New Way Lounge, where people in the community could come and share ideas and talk and perform and whatever. But within a year's time, Hubbub.com had gone from being just a website and a few soapbox sessions to being a vibrant and thriving organization. We... Uh, open the showroom, which is this beautiful facility where you are. Can you imagine that this was a Nash Rambler dealership at one time, and after that it was a shoe store? But it was a performance space, a gallery space, and upstairs there are four apartments where a group of artists and residents come every year, drawn from emerging artists all over the country to live and work in our community and to live and work in that space up there. And they work with all kinds of community organizations sharing their excitement about art. Hubbub organized top 20 events, music shows, art shows, uh, a skateboard art show, you name it. It has been held in this building. <laughs> and one thing that was happening was that all of this was generating lots and lots of ideas and lots of buzz in the community. And lots of people who started coming to Hubbub events started to go out in the community and start some of their own initiatives. The buzz was growing. Now, a lot of other good things were happening in Spartanburg at all the same time. It's not that just the Hubbub people and the Hub City people were doing all of this. But there were lots of businessmen who were investing in revitalizing it downtown and in locating corporate headquarters downtown. Uh, there was a new cultural center going up. There was a downtown revitalization plan with a new streetscape. All kinds of things were happening in town to make this a wonderful place to live. And best of all, lots of hip young people, and I wasn't hip or a young person anymore by this time, but lots of hip young people were coming back here to live and to settle. And some people who never even grew up here were coming to settle was becoming a wonderful place where we were happy to live. Oh, some of our artists and residents. In 2010, the Hub City Writers Project had the audacity in the middle of a recession to open a bookstore, a nonprofit independent bookstore. All three
through this, as we grew, as we became hub culture, a big umbrella to, to cover all of the events and the activities that we did, all through this process, the same idea was animating us that animated the original Hub City Writers Project volunteers. The idea that you could create community through dynamic arts and ideas. And that's what this organization has done. Now, you might be wondering, well, you know, that's nice, but, but what can we learn from this? And I've been thinking a lot about what it is about the hub culture model that has worked, what it is about this organization and group of volunteers which has grown and evolved and changed over time, what is it that they do really well? And I think one piece of it has to do with social capital. Um, sociologist Robert Putnam has written about this idea of civic engagement and social capital. Civic engagement is when you go out and you get involved in your community, when you vote or you uh, run for office, when you uh, volunteer at a soup kitchen or when you coach a little league team, all those unpaid things you do that make you feel connected to your neighbors and make you feel invested in your community. And he says that this investment that we build up is something called social capital, our sense of responsibility to each other. And it's every bit as valuable as economic capital. And he says that social capital makes us smarter, healthier, safer, richer, and better able to govern in a just and stable society. Well, Spartanburg had always had a lot of social capital. Lots of people who were willing to invest their time and their energy and their efforts and their vision and their creativity in this community. So one thing that has made this model work, the hub culture model, is the very commitment of building social capital. And one of the things that made hub culture in particular so effective, I think, was its focus on the arts on the creative, on the edgy and the visionary. Uh, the scholar named Richard Florida has written a lot about the power of a place that promotes creativity. He says that young people today don't want a place just where they can work. They look to live in a place where they can have a life. And he says that communities have to offer people with a community that is diverse, desirable, authentic, and cohesive. And in many ways, that's what the volunteers at Hub Culture have done over the years, is they've built this visionary, edgy, creative, accepting community that has encouraged people to stay here and to express themselves. I think we can take four lessons away from the Hub Culture model. First of all, you have to start small, but dream big. When Betsy and John and Gary sat down in the sandwich factory and decided to publish a book, they were just publishing a book, but their goal was to change the community. And that's a huge goal. They started with the book and then they went on to a few other things, the, the literary readings and then another book. And one thing led to another, to a much bigger thing. So they started small, but they dreamed big. Not everything worked. Not every book sold well. Not every event was well attended. But they never lost that big dream that was animating them, that idea of creating a stronger, better sense of community here. Second lesson, I think, is that you never, that you have to find that small group of thoughtful, committed citizens to work with you. And they're not always going to agree with you on every point. Um, when all this started up, John Blaine kept insisting that this was all about art. And Betsy Teeter kept saying, you can't have art if you don't have money. we got to have money. <laughs> it took both of their visions to make Hub City Writers Project and Hubbub work. But they had to, that, that whole commitment to the big goal was what kept tying them together. The third lesson, I think, is to build partnerships. Hub Culture has been really good at building partnerships. They've worked with the local 
uh, AIDS support organization. They've worked with Alzheimer's patients. They have worked with the city. They have worked with the Boys and Girls Clubs. They build partnerships all over the community that have allowed them to leverage their um, scarce resources to make a much bigger impact. And finally, reach out to many sectors of the community. The skateboard show was an amazing show. It coincided with the opening of a skateboard park here in Spartanburg, and the staff had curated a, uh, an exhibit of art painted on skateboards. And there were all kinds of people in this building. It was not just an organization that was reaching out to upper middle class professionals, but it was an organization that's reaching out to all segments of the population. And that's what's made it a place where people feel welcomed, where people feel like part of a major community, and where people feel like they can share creative vision. And that is the model that I think the lesson that we can take away from the hub culture model. It starts not by waiting for city leaders or somebody else to solve the problem. It starts with that small group of thoughtful, committed citizens who are willing to take some risks to make some changes. Thank you.